Thank you all for doing that. Good weekend. Weather changed, huh? Went from uh, pleasant to hot. Blink of an eye, that's what it does. Then it goes from hot to unbearable. Surface temperature <laughs> of the sun. Brian McDaniels. Oh, hey, Brian. What did, uh, what did Goldman do, or what are they accused of doing? Yeah, fraud. Yeah, I mean that, that your description is not exactly right, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the 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 bottom line is is that that the FCC is accusing Goldman of treating one customer differently than all the rest, right? And as we talked about with ethics and everything else, you got to have what's the magic word in today's business? It starts with a T. Transparency. And they were the opposite of transparent here, if it's true, and they're denying it. And it's very, very hard for the FCC to win these cases, because who can Goldman hire? Best lawyers in the world, and as many of them as they need. Um, but um, I think the reason why people are so upset about this is because they've long suspected that you know, there's an there's a information gap between people that have the money and people that don't with respect to the stock market. <coughs> See what happens. It's, it won't be the last one of these. Yeah. Jared, what's the problem with using your hand as a keyboard? <coughs> well, I really, you know, I, I meant what does your article say about it? While I am somewhat interested in what you think about the problem might be, I'm more interested in the fact in your article. Uh, they have like uh, this thing that like, it's like a projector that projects onto your hand. Wow, really? Sorry. Well, I'm standing right next to you. <laughs> Go ahead. You can uh, type in text like using the projector. Uh -huh. And like you can use it as a mouse to, like, to control the computer. Well, that's what you do with your iPhone, right? Oh, it's actually on your hand. Yeah, yeah. Like, like on your skin. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole different thing. Yeah. Oh, I like that. It like reads the frequency. Oh, this and, and Matt, you have a similar article, I, suppo I suppose. Yeah. Matt, so uh, this is skin put. Yeah, skin put. I like that. What tell so? How have I? How, why am I not aware of this, Matt? Uh, this seems right up my alley. You've been watching too many movies on your iPad. Yes, sad, sadly not true. But So I'm able to snap my fingers to answer calls, send texts all with my forearm? They can program it like how you want it. They can customize it so what you want to do with it. Oh, the possibilities for this are just, just ridiculous, right? Think of what you could do with skin put and chat roulette. <laughs> Margo, where are you? Hi, Margo. Two Margos. You're not Margo. You can't be Margo. What? I, I'm sorry, Marco. I said Margo. Hey, Margo. How are you? TBS and O'Brien, a match made in heaven. What do you think of this? Conan O'Brien going to TBS. Do you care what network he's on? Oh, TBS gets a lot of viewers because what type of reruns do they play? Family Guy, The Office. 
What's the problem with putting Conan on on TBS at that time? Who's he up against? Yes, Adult Swim. Is this going to work, Margo? No, I don't think they'll do that. But Adult Swim is such a massive money maker. Peter, where are you? Hi, Peter. It's been a bad couple months for Toyota. What's happening now? Um, the government um, signed a $16.4 million fine. Right, so we had the Prius, then we had the Lexus is rolling over, and then I saw something <coughs> else recently the Sienna, the Sienna minivan. What's happened? What do you think's happened? They got comfortable and they started getting lazy. I like that. Okay. Actually, they could have been sued for like $13.8 billion, but there's a cap. Well, this is a, 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 a fine, not a suit, right? Well, whatever. Yeah, it's a well, it's a big difference because they can be sued for whatever. Fine is... is but, right, the government, the government cap on it is, is 16. That's the most that... Which is a chump change. Yeah. So if there's, you know... We sue people and we have these big damages for two reasons, right? One's compensatory damages. What's that mean? What's compensatory damages? Very good. Compensation for what, Peter? Health problems. There is actually a chart, Peter, that if you were, God forbid, to lose an arm due to somebody else's negligence, they can look up in a chart based on your age how much that arm is worth. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. <laughs> Same with other parts of your body. Now, they have not figured in skin put to this, but that may... <laughs> so you've got compensatory damage on one side. Anybody know what the other type of damage that you can get in a lawsuit? Statutory. Well, statutory. No, somebody said it. What? Punitive. punitive. And what does that mean? What's the rationale for punitive damages? Yeah. What's, a, what's another word that starts with P-U-N? Punish, right? That would be a fun game. What other words start with P-U-N? It's almost like pu putty? No. <laughs> Is that a game I like to play with my children? <laughs> there are three colors and three colors only that have no rhymes. There is one fruit and one fruit only that has its seeds on the outside. There are three, maybe four, words that start with DW. What are they? Very good. And I would throw dweeb in there, too. <laughs> so punitive damages, in other words, that start with P-U-N, are meant to sort of punish, meant to deter. And that's why we have these big suits, $16 million or $160 million or whatever. They just don't, they don't care. It does not hurt them. A billion dollars, $2 billion, that might hurt. Connie, what did, a, uh, what did someone find at a bar recently? Where are you, Connie? Hi. They found what? Oh, the wrath of Steve Jobs. His little turtleneck head is going to pop right off in anger. <laughs> they're so secretive there, huh? Well, there's speculation that it's either someone left it or the prototype was stolen. Either way, right? Not yeah, good. Not good. Not good. And, and it found its way into the hands of a, of a internet website called Gizmodo, right? And in Gadget as well. And apparently they paid for it. So somebody made some money on this. And how's it look? That, that's not what we care about, though. What does it have? Front-facing camera. Anyway, what are the ethical issues here if, if somebody sold it? Um, I'm sure that would hurt Apple. Why? How does it really hurt Apple? It 
So they're not controlling the marketing at that point, and Apple's very careful about that. Wow. Lacey? Hi, Lacey. A lot of talk of skin today, huh? One article, you, you're controlling devices on your elbow. In this one, researchers have shown that sagging skin is not the only thing contributing to the look of old age. You chose this article, why, Lacey? <laughs> You love NPR. I it was really no point required, right? No, because, because it's small things it considered. The, yeah, the, um, cosmetic industry. The cosmetic industry, yeah. a billion-dollar industry. Yeah. What is what is what is what about it? Well, I mean, if if it doesn't fix the problem, then I mean, if people start, if people find out that. Who here has problems with plastic surgery? Who here has no? You too. Who here has no problems with plastic surgery? <laughs> Not even gonna ask. Who here has no problems with plastic surgery? That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Embrace your inner beauty, people. I beg of you. I'm sorry? I said she may feel like she's beautiful, but the rest of us, she looks a mess. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think she feels herself beautiful at all. Zoe. <coughs> March slots revenues down at casino. How come? Um, uh, those two casinos that I wrote about are actually like 20 minutes away from where I live, so I, that's what I decided to Where do you out. live? I live in Mystic, Connecticut. Oh, sure. Like Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. Yeah. 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 Um, and Been to both of them. They were talking about how like people feel like the economy is getting better, but they're not really ready to come back to the casinos. Yeah. And they're not ready to like spend their extra Casinos are often an indicator of the economy's health. Not necessarily a leading indicator, as you say. What might be a leading indicator? What does that mean? It's a leading indicator of economic health. Yes. Yeah, give me an example of a company that's often said is a leading indicator. Good or bad. <coughs> Starbucks. People are much more willing to pay for the $10 macchiato or whatever at Starbucks when they feel that they got some money and they give that up before the economy as a whole. But yeah, casinos have, uh, have struggled. 
could you, could you, would you mind not continuing to flip that coin? Well, what is going on with the coin? It's making some noise. By itself, I assume. You're doing that with your mind? Gracie, how do we create, <laughs> how do we create better advertising? Isn't telekinesis setting things on fire with your mind? <laughs> what's, what's, what's setting things on fire with your mind? What is it? Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Chuck Norris. Um, <laughs> after Chuck Norris left, they were just called the islands, not the Virgin Islands. Gracie. How do we create better advertising? Uh, well, Mark mainly describes how uh, you first have to have like, a good idea before you yeah. invest. You have to have a good idea. And you got to have a good business and um, kind of build it up before you like, hit the advertising. Scene. And I think it wasn't mainly about like, marketing it and everything, but mainly more about like, the company and how you need to build it up first. Yeah, that, that, that sounds wildly unhelpful. Oh, very good. I know exactly what I need to do. Did you agree with this, Gracie? I think so too. That's okay? You doing Chuck Norris jokes? <laughs> they never get old. Well, boy, this touch skin thing is everywhere. <laughs> Many of you have this. Yeah, this, this just drives me crazy. Gabrielle, where are you? Or Gabriel? Hi. Five major U.S. airlines are committing to not charging a fee for carry-on bags. Mm -hmm. Oof. That means that some are going to give us a fee for just walking on with our bag. Airlines, they, uh, and what constitutes a bag? A bag of chips or a, a bag or what? Well, many of, look, Southwest is the only one that, at this point that doesn't charge you for, for check bags. Two. No, JetBlue charges you. All right. Oh. Katie, what are, uh, what are businesses built on fear? Yeah. talked earlier in the semester that so much marketing is based on what? Fear and sex, right? Or fear of sex. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's our remaining schedule. Schedule. So, in an effort to try and get you all to move the needle a little bit beyond the 80 percentile mark, average, we're going to hold a in-class study day on Wednesday, thereby guaranteeing me that you will at least study for 45 minutes for the test. It's an experiment, okay? So I'll post the slides. I'll try and do that tonight, I guess, or tomorrow. Um, come to class. You can break into groups. I don't really care. Um, do this for 45 minutes, then you can leave. So it's a short class on Wednesday. Alex, you will be here. Thank you. I will not. Um, <laughs> You will, you will bring a current event to prove that you're here. And Alex, you're hereby able to shuffle the current events and call on several people and make sure that nobody makes the bad, bad mistake of handing in a current event and actually not being in here. I give you fair warning, it will result in an F. Um, Monday, I will do a review and answer any questions that you have and give a summation lecture. It is inspiring. In addition to being required here, you'll want to be here. You'll leave inspired. Um, 
It will be our last class. We will be sad. Just because? <laughs> Such a bad, bad, unconvincing argument. I, the, the worst type of argument is that you should give me something just because. There's no transactional exchange there. If you go to an internet and you, an internet website, if you go to an internet, go to an internet sometime. <laughs> if you go to a website and they ask for your email and they say, give us your email just because, what will you do? Especially if they spell it C-U-Z. <laughs> what will you do? You will not give it to them just because, will you? What will you do just because? No, just because. What will you do for somebody else just because? Huh? You help your mom? Just cause? No, you help your mom because she birthed your pale ass, right? <laughs> you help your mom because she fed you and she loves you. And you help your mom because when you go home, at least before you start bickering, you love each other, right? And your mom provides you with lots of things. You don't do it just cause. Oh, because they're ingrained hardwired into your brain. So many reasons, not just because. We do very, very few things just because. And what I don't ever do just because is give grades away. Touche? Right. <laughs> Figuring out what value propositions are. Let's play the, do you mind sort of playing this out a little farther? What type of value, do, do you understand what I'm saying when I say value proposition? Why don't, let's define that phrase, that's two word phrase, value proposition. I use it a lot. And it occurs to me that I may use a phrase that nobody knows what I'm talking about. I'd like you, I would like you to puzzle through this and figure out what value proposition means. You've taken the words and you've rearranged them. <laughs> what does it mean? Which is a good step. Well, not necessarily. Anytime we market or sell anything, there has to be what? A value proposition. You are willing to part with typically your money because you value that thing that you're getting in exchange for your money more than you value the money, right? So we have to make that clear. As we move into this era where so much of what we want is connection, an email address or whatever, let, let's, let's break it down into something that maybe freshmen business students might understand better. What's the value proposition of love? What's the value proposition of sex? What's the value proposition that we're looking for when we go out for a night on the town? Is there a value proposition? What is our most scarce resource? Time. So if you go out on, an, on a town and you go down to, um, I don't know, some place in the French Quarter where you go, um, and there are others there, and you start making eye contact with a member of the opposite sex, or the same sex if that's your thing, <laughs> and over on this side, there's someone, you're also doing the eye contact thing, you know? <laughs> And you're feeling pretty good about yourself, and you have, you know, you're like a dog caught between two owners, each of them saying, come here, little, you know, doggy, <laughs> right? And you're being pulled. Now, some of you may have such powers that you can bring them both to you. <laughs> but most don't, right? And instead, you will have to do what? Choose. And you have to choose because why would you choose? No, 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 because one represents more value, right? And you can only, again, unless you've got the power, you can only be with one or the other at any given time. So if you choose this one, what, who can't you choose? That one. And that's what we call in economic terms what? Opportunity cost. We can't do more than one thing at any given time, at least not well. Believe me, even if you are able to bring them together, there's still opportunity cost even in that lovely dynamic, if that's what you're into, right? So we have to make choices. 
And if you're online and you're looking for something and you want my email, you better give me a compelling value proposition to get that, right? Because I'm not going to do it just because. And I'm not going to give everybody three points just because. There's no value proposition there. You get no value, I get no value. What might be a better argument? How can we, how can we puzzle through ways in which I get value out of that dynamic and you do? You figure that out, maybe you get your three points. So next Wednesday, you will come with a Scantron and a number two pencil. Anyone who is preparing a paper in lieu of the test, right? And I, I don't know that anybody is at this point. I believe that I had set up some sort of hurdle over which you had to jump to do that, that you had to give me a proposal, I think. I don't remember seeing any of these. If so, if you have, you will give this to me at the beginning of class. We will shake hands and you will depart. Anyone who has given me a proposal for the paper to potentially rescue them from failing due to excessive absences will also hand this at the beginning of class. And bear in mind, I believe I set a, a time frame upon which I would receive these proposals. I think it was today. I think so. I don't think I've received any. So are we clear at this point? Everybody know what's got it? Yes, sir. Uh, no, you don't. You certainly don't have to do one on the test day, uh, Wednesday, and on the Monday. I think we'll just we'll just uh, we'll just talk, and I'll give my little lecture, and you guys will be on your way. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Just no, remember, you have no final in here. You are done after Wednesday. I do the grades, I average them out, I look at things, I post the grades. You guys check Blackboard or wherever, Laura, and you celebrate or you do the opposite of celebrate. Mourn. Yes? When are you going to post the slides? When am I going to post the slides? That, that, is, the, that is always the question I fear. I will post them just as soon as I can. Essentially, as soon as I remember, but it won't hurt any of you all, nor will I be aggrieved at any of you all if you send me emails saying post the damn slides. And you can actually say post the damn slides. <laughs> it's okay. Other questions? I like the questions. The questions are good. Everybody's clear. No confusion at this point. Excellent. <coughs> Last time we talked about what? Entrepreneurship management, yeah. Level five. Level five leaders. How to avoid some pitfalls. What is the window mirror concept? Anybody? Certainly going to be on the test, I would think. Yes, Tyler. Way in the back. Which basketball coach do you speak of? You know why you don't remember? No, because there was no basketball coach in the lecture. I think I did use coach as an example, but you've taken it and made it into a basketball coach. This applies to more than just basketball coaches. It applies to more than just coaches. In fact, we're talking about leaders generally, but go on ahead. Yes. He would give credit. He would look out the window. Yes. Good. What's another trait of a level five leader? Zoe. Empathy. Empathy. Good for you. What does that mean, Zoe? Yeah. They're able to, empathy we asso associate with what? IQ or EQ? EQ, emotional intelligence. It's another level five. Tyler, you're just bursting at the seams back there. Uh, this is your favorite thing? Have you not had a hot fudge sundae? 
<laughs> Go ahead. Also, Not going to touch that one. Go ahead. Have you rarely ever seen them like, trying to get um, attention? Yes. Like, credit, but they're always working. More plow horse than show horse. I was getting to that. I, I <laughs> took the words out of your mouth. Excellent. What else? Yes. They um, would much rather set the company up for success when they're gone. Ah, crucial. They want to build sustainable, durable companies that last even beyond them, which means what? What does that say about their relationship to the company? Sorry? Well, that's good. Do they value the company more than they value their own sort of personal <laughs> ego basis? Yes? Yeah, steward might be a, a word that, that I would choose instead of servant. Very good. So we've got some level five stuff going on. Um, after the, le yes? No, please don't apologize. I, I love the discourse. It's my favorite, favorite part of teaching. Discourse. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if that's a, a necessarily level five thing. I think you can find some level four leaders that do that. The, the level five one tends to be the, the, the modesty and will. That's the real determinant, that they, they are humble, humility, but f very driven. But it's certainly a great trait of a leader. I don't know that, it, that it's necessarily unique to level five, but it's, so it's a good trait. Um, after the lecture, did anyone walk away thinking, you know, I am, I am not an entrepreneur? Oh, well, that's good. Did anyone go walk away as thinking, I am much more a manager type than an entrepreneur? Really? A little bit, Hillary? How so? I'm sorry? I guess I just know that I'm good at like, banding people. Good. It's an evolved type of uh, thought process. I think it's easy to, to everyone. The default is I'm an entrepreneur. I think it usually takes some experience where you go, you know, I'm, I'm better suited to be managerial. Do not make the mistake of thinking that you can't have a fantastic career, become wealthy if that's your thing, or do whatever in a managerial capacity. We desperately need good managers, right? Because everybody in the world thinks that they're a good entrepreneur. Most aren't, by the way. But we desperately need people that, that want to sort of support and build. And, and typically, they've got personalities that, that require certain more order. You know, entrepreneurs don't, don't race for order. Um, any of you all think of your parents when you thought of, when I asked who are inspiring leaders? A couple people? A lot of people. That's good. Your parents have done something good. It's great. All right. So now, let's start with this. This will be easier. Our final sort of substantive lecture. Makes me sad. This has been a great class. I just have to say, this is absolutely probably. No, 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 no. Please don't. No. No. Do, do, that, do that next time. Um, no, I, I just got to say, I wish I could figure out, and I don't, I don't mean to, to, to uh, say my other classes haven't been good, uh, but something, something about this one, and, and I give you guys all the credit. This is, uh, I've looked forward to every one of these classes. And I, I really, it's because of you, because I don't, you know, what am I going to do? I, I don't change. I do the same stupid thing over and over again. But when you get that back and forth and you guys' willingness to engage and talk about this stuff, I wish I, could, wish I could bottle this. I wish I could figure out how to make every class like this one, and I thank you all for it. I do not clap. Um, 
All right, so our last substantive le lecture on accounting, finance, whatever. Do a quick little lecture on bootstrapping. Jeez, I'm running out of time. I don't, we'll do the best we can. We may have to do a little more on uh, Monday. So bootstrapping, um, the reason I like bootstrapping is because it's very, very realistic. Bootstrapping, the phrase comes from the idea of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. In other words, you're not looking outside for funds, okay? You don't have to go to a bank or an investor or whatever. Instead, you say, you know what? I, I'm going to just start something, try and sell enough of whatever it is that I'm doing to, to bootstrap the business. And so you start with a little bit of money, excuse me, very short sales cycle. Bootstrapping won't work if you, you make something and then you don't get paid for 90 days after you sell it. It just won't work. It's another reason why the internet's so good. Typically, stuff we buy on the internet, the payment happens right then and there. Um, recurring revenue, that just means that you're going to have stuff coming in. Your parents have probably suggested you read a book called The Four Hour Work Week. Has anybody heard of this book? I, I can't say that I'm a fan of the book, but one of the points that he makes is that, that you've got to have build businesses that have sort of recurring revenue. So for your musicians, if for you musicians, if you think about how hard it is to actually sell a CD or download or whatever, add a gig off your site, you really want to get people doing a subscription service where they're paying you X number of dollars a month. Okay? That's recurrent revenue. Many of you have these in your life, right? You've got things that you're paying three, five dollars a month. They're adding up, frankly. Um, this is real important too. Forecasting from the bottom up. So what, what happens a lot of times when you're starting with a business, when you're coming up with a business, is you, you'll look out at the market and you'll say, okay, we just want a sliver of it. We just want a fraction of this market. If the market for music is a billion dollars and we can get 1% of it, that's a million dollars, right? Or whatever, 10 million, whatever that is. A lot. Well, that's totally non-productive. What does that even mean? It's vague. Instead, figure out how much money you need to make to stay in business. So if you're a band, and I'm sorry for you non-band people, but just apply it to whatever you want to apply it to, and you figure, okay, we need five grand to make a record and five grand to market it, press it up, whatever, 10,000 bucks. And we can sell these CDs at 10 bucks a pop and we won't think about cost of goods right now. How many do you have to do from a bottoms up approach to break even? A thousand, right? Then you can make a plan to sell a thousand records. That makes all the sense in the world. And that's a bottom up uh, approach. Um, perfect is the enemy of good, right? In this day and age, in this, this accelerated time when we're controlling devices with our skin, we want to get stuff out into the market, adjust it, continuously improve, rather than you know, keeping it too close to you trying to make something perfect. And we call these things that go out into the market early what? Online. Beta. Sometimes alpha. Right? I encourage you to do that. Just like I was encouraging you the other day to get out there and just start something. Well, part of that is, you know, I'm going to throw a site together. It may not be beautiful. I'm going to make a record. It may not be dark side of the moon. I'm going to, you know, whatever, get it out there, get some feedback from customers, and then refine it. Function, you've got to solve people's problems. You've got to start from the premise of whatever I do has a functionality, right? We, we will leave, going back to our value proposition thing, if I'm on a website and it does not solve my problem, and now my problem may just be information, I'm gone. I, you know, as somebody that did A&R for 20 years, I can tell you exactly how long I would listen to a demo before I realized it was not going to solve my problem. How long do you all think? 30 seconds. Let's try that. Ready? Go.
Everybody says 30 seconds, and I don't think people realize how long 30 seconds is. We're still not there. You really think, would you listen for 30 seconds? Five. Right? Five. You throw something in. Now, again, if it catches you in those five seconds, you're not going to be able to make a decision. But you will be able to make, if it's good, you won't be able to make a, you will be able to make a decision if it's, if it's providing no value. You know what I'm saying? Well, look, if you put something in, you get some minimum. Five, you give it five seconds, and, then, and you'll know in five seconds, not for me. Now, you may be wrong, but you're going to make that judgment, especially if you have what I used to have, just hundreds of them. You've got to do that, right? Um, same with online. Check out my MySpace page. A, if it doesn't load, how fast are you going to wait? You going to wait 30 seconds for a page to load? No. So this is a real thing when you're building websites, when you're making music, when you're doing whatever. Think about your usages. You get to a website, if that booger doesn't load, what, how long do you give it? Maybe. Right? Even five seconds is pretty long. I can't see the little hand. Oh, now I see it. Go, you hit the website. Did you wait that long for it to load? No. It's really, really fast. It's really why my, one of the main reasons why MySpace failed. It's certainly why Friendster failed. We're not going to sit there. Now when you have what? What do you have that's pulling at you when you're sitting there waiting on a website to load? Huh? What's the economic term? Opportunity cost. That's literally your time that's just flittering away that you could be doing what? Something better, chat roulette, right? <laughs> Don't fight on all fronts, right? Focus, 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 focus. This goes back to one of our very early lectures when you were talking about how your market was everybody, right? And you said a seven-year-old and a 90-year-old person. And you're not wrong, but I hopefully made the point that if you focus on, this, on everybody, you won't work. And, and you certainly don't want to focus on the seven-year-olds or the 90-year-olds. You focus on, on core. So, you know, what is it that you have to get? Don't try and get everything. Uh, under staff, probably not all that relevant to you guys. Uh, but I do think it, it speaks to what we've talked about with regards to social entrepreneurship, all these things. We can do with a good team, two or three people, what used to just require dozens, if not hundreds of people. Again, I, I want to stress a point, you know, as you're thinking about starting businesses or whatever, your natural gravitational pull will be to people that are essentially you, right? And that's okay, but there's no complimentary thing there. So there's going to be a lot of redundancy of effort. I encourage you all to make friends with web designers, even if that's painful. Go direct. The, the error of middlemen is, is not long for this world, right? Way, way back when we talked about one of Michael Dell's key, you know, whatever, competitive advantages, he cut out the middleman, middle person. I like this a lot, too. I've talked to some of you all outside class on this. You've got to give what is called a schema, S-C-H-E-M-A. A schema is, is, a, is, a, is information, a picture, that you can sort of draw for people so that you don't have to explain everything. If you, for instance, had to explain to people what noise cancellation headphones do, that's really hard. Well, it takes an algorithm and reverses it. And, you know, what the hell are you talking about? But if you, if people, everybody knows what noise cancellation headphones do. So if you can say, well, what we're doing is making noise cancellation headphones or Bose headphones, but cheaper, you shortcut it all. That's why bands say all the time, well, we opened for so-and-so, right? All they're trying to do is present a schema. Oh, well, if you opened for the Almond Brothers, then you must be a jam band or whatever, right? Don't make the mistake that bands do all the time and say, we are like. You, I promise, are not like the Pixies meets Led Zeppelin meets whatever. If you were, you would be very famous, right? OK to say we are influenced by. Do not, in your bios and press materials, say, we sound like the unholy alliance between Slayer and Joan Baez. <laughs> no, you don't. 
although I'd like to hear that. Take the red pill, right? You've got to be very, very clear. Burn rate, this is a little formula that you, you probably know, right? How much money do you have divided by how much you're spending every month? If you got $1,000 and you're spending $100 a month, your burn rate is 10 months. It's division. That's assuming you have no income. If you've got $1,000 in the bank, you're spending $100 a month, but you're making $200 a month, you, you're, you're cash positive. You have no burn rate. Pardon? Didn't understand any of that. What? Cash positive? It's a beautiful sound. It is. All right. Let's see how much I can get through the other one. Not done. I got five minutes. We'll see how much we can get. All right, managerial accounting. Different types of accounting. The first is managerial, it's internal. In other words, you're the manager. You're working with the firm. You're trying to figure out cash flow. Cash flow is, simp is the most important thing for businesses, right? How much is coming in, how much is going out on a daily basis. You as a managerial account are responsible for creating budgets that make sense of this stuff. Cash flow, we talked about that. It's the money through the organization. It is the most important financial element. Test question. I'm pretty sure that'll be on there. What is the most important financial statement, whatever you want to call it? Cash flow. Cash flow. You don't have cash flow, you don't have a business. Budget, just a road map. Expenses and income, right? People don't like doing this. Some people do. Most people don't. If you don't, you will go out of business most of the time. Sales does cure all. I've seen a lot of people that, that just really have no business sense, but somehow have fallen ass backwards into it. They sell a lot of stuff. It will cure your problems. Sales cures all. But most of the time, you've got to forecast. You've got to have some sort of financial roadmap. You've got to memorize this. The accounting equation. Come up with some sort of mnemonic so that you memorize assets equals liability plus owner's equity. Try and explain this to you. Alex, you get this crap in accounting, right? You could do it. You could explain it for me. What they struggle with is owner's equity. I always struggle with assets and liabilities. Owner's equity is harder for, so you, so you stop me and, and, and you know, if, if you've got a better way to explain it, I would, I would welcome that. So these are your assets, your resources, stuff you own, stuff of value. Cash is an asset. Inventory, to a certain degree, is an asset. Because you can potentially sell it, right? If you have a business that has land, you can sell it. Anything that you could turn into cash or cash itself is an asset. You'll learn about depreciation and some other things once you get into your accounting classes. But for now, anything you can turn into cash is an asset. Liabilities, it's what you owe. Right? So if you decide you're going to make CDs, you get a bunch of CDs, those are assets, but you got a liability, you got to pay the person that made the CDs. Here's where we get into trouble. Owner's Act, right? This all leads up to the idea of the balance sheet. Okay? You always have to have your assets and your liabilities balancing. Think about it this way, and I know I've only got one or two minutes, and I'll go back to come back to it again on, I guess, Monday. If you, if you have $1,000, right, but you owe $2,000, 
your assets and your liabilities don't balance. Where is that other thousand dollars going to come from to keep you from going bankrupt? Sorry? Sorry? Well, no, you say you, you, you need, you need $1,000 to balance this, and you can't convert any of your assets into, into uh, you know, you can't cash. Where do you get it? You can borrow, but that's not equity. You could sell some piece of your company, right? You could say, okay, stocks, what have you, investment, where you're trading. Equity kind of just means ownership. You're trading some of your ownership for that income. And don't leave. I've got one more minute. I'm going to hold you. I hardly ever do this. So you get equity to come in and balance it. Now, it goes the other way, too. At the end of the year, you got $2,000 in cash and $1,000 in liabilities. You pay off your $1,000, your liabilities, now you got $1,000 cash and zero liabilities. You're out of balance. What do you do with that $1,000 in cash to balance? You can, you can reinvest it, or you pay it out to the equity stakeholders. Remember that person that invested that $1,000 to, to balance you before when you needed the money? He or she, being an owner, can get it, and this is paid through dividends, right? You've heard that? And that balances it. We'll pick up on this again. This is hard to explain. <laughs>